important. Is, what, is, what does he have to say here? Let's take a look, first of all. Page. <coughs> Four. The Rebbe says that the 25th of Adar is the birthday of the Rebbe Sechayim Mushkin. And on her birthday, the year after Mustalkus, I think it was, the Rebbe spoke about what can we learn from a birthday. There are certain customs that Hasidim do on their birthday, which were conveyed to us by the previous Rebbe. And so he says, he says here, what are these customs? Number one, on a person's birthday, they should take some time for themselves to think about who they are and what they're doing here. Everybody has a mission. And hopefully we'll, we'll recognize our mission when it comes along and be able to fulfill it. And also hopefully not mess things up along the way because the person can come here, says in the yang yang, what 60, 70 years, 70, 80 years, just to pay back a debt. There's a great song about that. Obviously I can't say Too it. Too obviously. You know. oh, Hashem, oh, Hashem. <laughs> 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 Did I just get roasted by you? Well, yeah, you, well, you set it up, you know. I, you, you asked I'm for here it. for it, honestly. You really asked for it, as long as it was about you. So. And that's what we call a kosher roast. I love it. <laughs> uh, love it to, keep up in here. to think about what you're doing here and how far you've got along the path, you've gotten along the path, and how far you have to go. Rotem. him. Yes. <laughs> I told you I'd get there. Who, who are you? I'm Vera, Vera Gold. I'm not just She's sister. Not sister. She's your sister? My older sister, yes. Oh, she's your older sister? Yes. I'm here for a couple of weeks this summer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Los Angeles. Oh, I have a family here, my daughter. Children, husband, Marley, doables. Is that do I pronounce that right, Marley? Gosh, a lot of people that I've never met before. This is Marley. Yes. Good evening, Marley. Thank you for joining us. Where are you live? Where do you live? I don't hear from you. Just got a big smile. Okay. Oh, in Brazil. Yeah, I'm not Chasconis. We know what comes from Brazil. We have I have I have family in Brazil. In, yeah. In Sao Paulo. Where? São Paulo? Yes. Um who is uh, um Rabbi Zion. Rabino Noah? Noah Rabino Zion. My, my sister-in-law, my wife's sister is married to her. What? And we have Devora here from, from Brazil. In Sao Paulo. Hi, who are you? My sister, Yocheved Mizrach. Okay, take a seat. This is a, this is a big crowd here tonight. And we have a lot of people online that I've never met before. Aline Reza. Oh, Aline, I know you. She, Aline is also from Brazil. She's online right now. Yeah. Hi, Devora. Nice to see you again. A long time we didn't see you. Here, Devora. This is your friend. Say hello. Say hello to Devora. I don't know who this is. Yeah, she was in class with you. Oh, I see a tickle. That's why I'm confused. No, that's someone else. That's somebody else. Who do I know? You know Devora. She used to sit right there in the class on my left side. Exactly. Oh, no. Hi, Mama. Yeah, this, no, is wearing... this is oh, it. Okay, there it is. Yes. When you showed me the picture with someone wearing a tail hole. You got it? Yeah, That's now I know who that is. Hi. Yeah, I really want to say hello to her. Yeah, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, this is the birthday of our evening class for the sun. <laughs> when the thing comes into being. Uh, 
what is the significance of a birthday? A birthday is the day that your neshama comes down into this world and it begins your life's trek to the world. There's a famous story about a great, great Hasid named Menachem Mendel. The Alter Rebbe wanted him to be Rebbe. He was a child prodigy, a genius. And, and his teacher was the Magad of Mezerich. And the Magad was worried about him. He, he seemed to him a little too cocky. That means like proud of himself. She wasn't really, but it seemed that way. And the Magad was concerned. So he took him to the Baal Shem Tov. And when here's a uh, head, when the Baal, Shem, the Baal Shem Tov told him a story. There were many details in the story. That story was actually the story of his life. And when he went to Eretz Yisrael, after the Magad passed away, he went to Eretz Yisrael. The Alt Rebbe wanted him to be his Rebbe, wanted him to be the Rebbe, wanted him to take over the Nisius, that means the leadership of the Hasidic movement at that time. And the Alt Rebbe accompanied him as far as he could go, I think to Crimea. We had to cross the water to get to the mainland to continue his journey to Eretz Yisrael. And there they, they sequestered themselves for some time together and he sent the Alter Rebbe back. Okay. On his way there, he stopped to see one of the people who had been present at that story when the story was told to that young boy. <laughs> Now he was grown up. One of the people there was Rabbi Yaakov Yosef, who was a Rebbe, who was a Rav in Polonoi, a tremendous Talmud Chacham. He was the first person to publicly make known the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. Because until then, Hasidus was all private and secret, just for special people. She was the first one to publish a book. So any young people from not Hasidic families were caught with this book, their life was in danger, literally. Okay. So he stopped, he made a detour to go to Palanoi to visit this rab, rabbi, Yasef, ya, uh, ya, Yaakov Yasef of Palanoi. And they, they spoke together very intimately and the Rav asked him, Reb Menachem Mendel asked him, do you remember that story that the Baal Shem Tov told you? He said, yes. That's why I came to see you. That's why I made a detour to be here because that was part of the story. So he said, did you understand the story when he told it? He said, I understood the story as far as I had gotten in life at that point. More than that, I could not understand. <clears throat> and now I'm up to, to you. So from this story, we see that each person really has a, a life course that has been mapped out for them before they can come here. So we have to be alert to discover this as we go along. And never to think, to imagine or fool ourselves into thinking that there's free time or there's time that isn't meaningful or there's time that doesn't have something for us to fulfill in, in our life's journey. So this is what you have to think about on your birthday. On a birthday also says here on page four, on a birthday a person's mazel is very strong. That means to say that the source of life in them is, gets a new charge. Like when you plug in your cell phone, it gets charged up again. That's what happens on your birthday. You, your soul gets charged up again with new energy and new inspiration. Another example of this, for instance, is the Alter Rebbe and his son, Dovber, who became the Mittler Rebbe. That he had a teacher, a brilliant teacher, who taught him privately. And every year the teacher would go home for Pesach to spend Pesach with his family. 
Naldre would pay him and give him a bracha to come back to resume the teaching after Pesach. One year, he paid him and he didn't give him the bracha to come back. He wondered, is it possible that the Alter Rebbe deliberately didn't tell me to come back? Or was it an oversight? He always tells me to come back, he expects me to teach. Um, well, he, he decided I'll come back anyway. So he came back and he resumed teaching with the Mittler Rebbe. After one class, he went to the Alter Rebbe and he said, now I know why you didn't give me a bracha to come back. I can't teach him anymore. He had a bar mitzvah. Well, I went over since last time, since the last time I spoke to him, celebrated his bar mitzvah. I guess he went home for Hanukkah. Must be for Hanukkah because his, his birthday was the same day he was he passed on as the ninth day of Kislev. So it must have been, he went home out for Hanukkah and he came back and said, I can't teach him anymore because he has new brains. It's called Moichan the Godless. His brains have become great and he's way beyond me. I can't, I have nothing more to teach him. The Mitzvah Rebbe, the young Bar Mitzvah boy had become transformed. Not just he was 13 years old, he could participate in a minion. He was a different person. So we see on a birthday, a person has a plug in the cell phone of your brains that you get new life and, and on spiritual levels and intellectual levels and emotional levels. How are you gonna plug, how are you gonna access that, that charge, that increased muzzle? How are you gonna do it? Well, let's be simple about it. One way, uh, my suggestions are as follow, follows. And then learn on your birthday more than you might have learned before. Give it a few lines. Learn your new chapter of Tehillim for the year that you are now embarking on. If possible, learn it with a commentary. If possible, learn it with a Hasidic commentary, ask your Chabad rabbi to look it up in the teachings of the Rebbeim. Where can we find it? And we have apps now that you can just put in the, the, your, your uh, they've been developed now. This, this is last year by Rebbe Drive. They've developed an app in English letters and in Hebrew. And the, if you want to find out about your capital Tilim, you can find out everything in Hasidic that was ever said about it. But just with a click, it's fantastic. So that's another thing to do. Give charity. If you give 25 cents regularly on charity, maybe the, on your birthday, you'll give 50. If you give to one person 25 cents, maybe on your birthday, you'll give to five people. You give more. If you give coldly, maybe give with a smile. There's a big difference. It says in the Gomorrah and Baba Basra that a person who gives charity just like that, merits six blessings. And it tells you, it brings verses, psukim, a blessing about giving charity to show you, you see all these six blessings you get. But if you give with a smile and you say, how's your family? How are you feeling today? Then get, there's 11, 11 psukim, 11 blessings. So the way that you give charity on your birthday should also be enhanced. All these are aspects of your mazel is greater. And another thing to do, since you have a stronger mazel on your birthday, is to tap into it and share it with others. Give people blessings. How do you do that? Every time you look at somebody, think to yourself, what could this person need? And let, and let them know. Yeah. And, and what do they need? What could this person really use? Maybe you're, you, if you know them, you know, how's your mother? How's your aunt Florence? Does she need a, a refuah shalema? How's your friend? Does she need a shidduch? And, who, and when you bless somebody, 
it, it redounds back on you because we learned from, from Sarah, you may know, that when you bless somebody with something and you need the same thing, you answer first. You can answer first. Reminds me of a story when I used to live in Buffalo. There were two boys named Chaim. Chaim is the gematria, adds up to number. Ches is eight. Yud, Yud is 20, right? 28. And Mem is 40. 28 and 40 is, come on. 68. 68. So oh, Chaim, Chaim, good. Chaim is equal to 68. These two boys were both called Chaim. And they lived at 68 Merrimack. I remember the name of the streets. And they had wives who were both teachers in the Chabad school. And neither of them had children. A year, two years. And one day, one of them, I think it was Esther, lived upstairs. And Ruth lived downstairs. And Esther comes down to Ruthie and says, what are you what can you what are you supposed to say to somebody if you want to tell them something that you're not supposed to tell anybody? What could that be? That's when a woman is in the first year months of pregnancy, they don't talk. They don't, they don't want people to know about it. It's a private thing until you know it's quite obvious that they're expecting and they put on maternity clothes. Or, well, they don't talk about it. So she kind of comes down and she's sort of giggling. She says, what do you tell some, if you, you know, if you want to tell somebody something, but you don't want, so it's not something that you, you don't really want them to tell them. And, and the other one giggled also and said, yeah, but what happens if they also want to do the same thing? The both of them were expecting because the one upstairs had written to ask a bracha for the one downstairs but to the Rebbe and asked the bracha that her, her very dear friend who lived downstairs, the wife of Chai, the downstairs Chaim, should be blessed with a, a child. And at the end of the letter, she said, and, uh, maybe I could also have a similar bracha. And they, they both became, and the one who wrote to the Rebbe had the child first. So this is something to do on your birthday is to give people blessings because you have an, an extra power to bless that you didn't have the day before. Because your mazel is very strong. That's why you say mazel toy, you should have a good mazel. Becoming, somebody who comes engaged, you say mazel toy, you should have a good mazel. Should be, this should be the beginning of more mazel dicker things, more good things. Like the two days after your birthday, you have kind of the power to give brushes? It's true, not only, but not just for three days. You can keep on giving brachas all you want. And if you think that it's connected to your birthday, then it's connected to your birthday. Because where your mind is, that's where you are. That's where you are. Now, this is also connected on, the, on a large general scale with the birthday of the Rebetzin, because the birthday of the Rebetzin is the 25th day of Adar, which is extraordinary, because here we see that the Rebetzin, a Rebbe, a Rebetzin, a man and a wife, is like a body and a soul. Who's the body, who's the soul? The, 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 yes, the Rebetzin is certainly the soul, though they say, you know, it's not exactly the same, but they say behind every, behind every good man is a better woman. The, the, the wife, the wife, it says in the Mimer for the Hasana that the Kala is the source of all the blessings for the family. So I always tell a Hasan, you know, remember, treat your wife better than the bank manager. <laughs> She's the source of all your blessings. Don't lose your cool, don't ever lose your cool. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, burst out angrily at your bank manager. Don't ever. So the wife is a source of all the blessings and that applies constantly because the wife is the panemius of the home. She brings the spirit of Shabbos and holiness into the home. And now the rabbits and her neshama comes into the world on the day that the world was created. 25th of Adar. 
is the first day of creation. And then we have 25, sec, 26 is the second day of creation. 27 is the third day of creation. 28 is the fourth day of creation. 29 is the fifth day of creation. Wait, are we talking about Adar or Elul? Adar. Hold your question. Fasten your seatbelt. Okay. <laughs> and we're up to 2930. Is Reish Chaydesh Nisan, sixth day of creation. Who's born on the sixth day of creation? Adam and Chava. So humanity, creation of mankind. So this all started six days earlier. The first day of creation is six days earlier. That's the Rebetzin's birthday. So the Rebetzin herself is connected with the creative life force of the whole world. The whole world. How do you like them apples? The apples are why we're in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is very, this is extraordinary. Okay, so 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 Malka Levana has a question. Are we talking about Elo? Didn't, wasn't the world created in Elo? So well, the answer is yes. But you've learned in Hasidus about that. Yeah. We have a we have a disagree. We have Rabbi Yoshua says okay. the world is created in Nisan, that man is created on the first day of Nisan, and then later on the first day of Nisan, 240. For 45 years later, the Mishkan is erected on the first day of Nisan. First day of Nisan took 10 crowns, it says. So, so the first day of Nisan is the creation of man according to Rabbi Yehoshua, one of the greatest students of Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai. However, one of his colleagues disagreed with him, that's Rabbi uh, Eliezer, was called Rabbi, Eli, Rabbi Eliezer the Great. He's called Rabbi Eliezer the Great because he he had such, he was a Baal Tshuva. He had such self-sacrifice to learn Torah. He left his, his father was wealthy, his father, but his father didn't like Torah scholars and he ran away and he had no money. He actually ate grass to survive until his Rebbe, Rabbi Eliezer smelled that he, he smelled like a dying person. And he took him under his wing and he taught him and he learned so intensely that he remembered everything that his Rebbe taught him, everything. And he never taught anything that he didn't hear from his Rebbe. He wouldn't say anything that he didn't hear from his Rebbe. And he's called in the Mishnah, in the second chapter of Mishnah, Turkey Abbas, his Rebbe Eliezer, his, his Rebbe referred to him as a cistern that's plastered so perfectly that not one drop of water leaks out. What? What? What's the question? What's a cistern? Good question. It's not a brethren. <laughs> it's a con big container. I don't know exactly what a cistern is. It says wine would be gathered in cisterns or oil would be gathered in cisterns, like big containers. Maybe there were big jugs. I'm not sure what a cistern. I never saw a picture of a cistern, so I'm not sure. But I, I, there's receptacles that hold things. So he said, bor, bor sid, plastered, shenamabed tippa. It doesn't lose a single drop. Yes, that's Rabbi Eliezer. You learned it by heart when you were a little girl. I learned it by heart. I not really learning much. Oh, okay, good. Excellent. Very good. Very glad to hear that. Keep up your learning by heart. Keep it up and don't stop every day. Do it. Keep at it. We'll help you in every single way, but physically and spiritually and emotionally and mentally and every way. Okay, so that's Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer says, no, the world is created on the first day of Tishrei. The world was created on the 26th of Elul, and Adam Marishan was born on the first day of, uh, of, of Tishrei. So how are we going to deal with this? Yeah, that, um, were we recording? Yes. Yes. Okay. So how do we deal with this? Hasidus explains, how could, it be, how could it be that they're both right? You know, like the old story, two Jews are arguing, and yeah. a third one comes along, 
and they asked him to arbitrate. So the first one states his, 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 his points, and he says, I think you're right. The other one says, no, wait a minute, you didn't hear me yet. So the, the, the other one says, well, what do you have to say? So the other one tells his point of view. He says, I think you're right. So another guy goes by and says, how can they both be right? He says, you're also right. <laughs> so, so the same thing in Torah, we have Rabbi Eliezer says the world is created on Tishrei, first day of Tishrei. No, man is, birthday of man is the birthday of Tishrei. Rabbi Yoshua says the birthday of man is the first day of Nisan. How can they both be right? Hasidus resolves the difficulty by saying, this afternoon, girls, you thought about coming to this class when you heard about it, right? And you decide you're coming. Mm -hmm. But this means, excuse me, eight o'clock, you came. So you can do a thing in your mind and you can do it yourself, physically. So in Hashem's mind, the creation took place on the first day of Nisan. And the mind is superior the mind can contain much more than, that, than the action. But the actual fact, the physical creation of mankind took place, according to Rabbi Eliezer, on the first day of the seventh month. That's what it says in the, in the Chumash. It says in the Torah, Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the seventh month. On the first day of the seventh month, we're going to pull the shofar for the creation of mankind. So we have two levels of creation, the level on the thought and the level... Uh, in actuality, in physical, material actuality, and they are both true, and they are both birthdays of mankind. And the, and the birthday in thought is the 25th day of Adar, when the Rebetzin was born. Okay, Chadwa, you want to ask a question? It's not like comparable to like the blueprint and then the building. Yes, 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 very good, very good point. It's like, it's like the, the relationship of a blueprint to the building. First, you have to have the blueprint, and then you have the building. It says, hey, and when Hashem created the world, first he made the blueprint, that's the Torah. And then he looked like an architect, follows the blueprint, Hashem looked in the Torah and created the world. He created the world in thought on the 25th of other, but the, the Torah was even before that. He looked in the Torah in order to create the world. This is also connected with the, with the building of the Mishkan, that the Mishkan was built on the first day of Nisan. That's when it was erected. And this became a home for Hashem. So now this completed the erection, setting up the Mishkan, gave Hashem adir b'tachtoinim. That's the whole purpose of creation. Why did Hashem create the world? Because, he says in the Tanya, he wanted to have a dwelling place of his own in this physical world. That's why people want to have a home. People don't want to be homeless. It's terrible to be homeless. And we, ha and we have that desire because Hashem also wants a home. And the dira betach that Hashem wanted is a physical dira, which was the Mishkan, which later became the sanctuary after the Jews came to Eretz Yisrael, became the Mishkan, had solid walls, but still the same temporary curtains for a roof, skins and so on for the roof for all th over 300, uh, 360 years, a long time, till the Mishkan was uh, 300, almost getting on to 400 years, 370, 69 years, I think it was, or close to it, until it was destroyed. And then finally, uh, Shaul Amalek was anointed as king. <clears throat> and the first, the jobs of the king, of the Jewish people, his first jobs are to defeat, defeat the enemies of the Jewish people, especially Amalek, and to build the base of Migdash. Well, Shaul lost the kingship, it's a whole story, 
and, and it was given over to David HaMelech, who was his son-in-law. And he became the king and he purchased the land for the base of Mikdash. And he made the designs for the base of Mikdash and his son Shlomo built it. So that, that's a development and the history of the, of the, 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 the building of a home for Hashem, which began on the birthday of mankind. So all these ideas are connected with the idea of a birthday, which is a, a, a beginning of life and each year a renewal of life, taking it to the next level. What should we do? What did the Rebbe say here? On page, we look on page five here. The previous rabbi says on a birthday, a person should review the history of his life and think about how he can improve. By through doing tshuva, increasing in tzedakah, in the morning and the afternoon, studying more Torah, revealed Torah. Revealed Torah means like Chumash, Halacha, Mishnah, and, and, and Panimius of Torah means Tanya, or Sichas which are available online in English, in Hebrew, in any language you speak, even in Portuguese. For those of you from Brazil, where the mm -hmm come from. <laughs> You're not from Brazil, are you? Oh, you are? <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Where did the Spanish There's a bar mitzvah took place today for uh, Mrs. Uh, Hannah Slonim from Rio. Her grandson from, from Paolo Alto, her grandson was bar mitzvah today. I was like to be there and to say l'chaim with the family, Bo Hashem. And to daven better, to say more tilim, if it's possible to say more tilim, to say tilim for that day. If you don't already say tilim, you should say tilim for that day, which is your birthday. If you're capable, you should say tilim for that day of the week. You know, like tilim is divided into seven books according to seven days of the week say to them for that day or you could say to them for what's happening you. Yeah. i don't do it okay there we go you could say to them uh or maybe one one book of tilling of the five books of tilling or if you're really fluent if you see them are really fluent, they can say the whole tilling in two hours say the whole tilling takes me a week it would be appropriate, he writes, that family should gather with friends in a very happy move and have really have a party. And, and they should speak about what are they going to do this year that's better than the year before. And that one person encourages the other so that they use out the idea that since nothing is by accident, welcome, ladies. Thank you for coming. Can we get some chairs for them? Uh, that yeah. since by divine providence, since by divine providence, you're having a birthday. So what's the point? There must be a point that there should be an increase in Torah and Mitzvahs because of your birthday. So you can invite your friends over and you have some good food. Nice things to drink, coffee, tea, ice cream, soda, or healthy drinks, fruit drinks, whatever you, you know, and and you speak about good ideas that you could all share together that, that everybody could improve. And the Rebbe goes on to say, and children should also do the same thing. So that my, when my grandchildren now go to, to yeshiva, Haider on their birthday, they take a little bag with stocker for every kid in the class and, and bags, birthday bags. So everybody says a bracha, okay? Uh, now, moving through this, I, I'm, each one of you will take this, you'll be able to read through it at your leisure. It's really not well organized. It's, it's, it's a, a collection of things that the Rebbe said in different places about the significance of a birthday. Here, like on page 10, he says, why were you born to make a dear betachrim, to make a sanctuary for Hashem?
Now, turning, yeah, to page 12. Turn to page 12 in this collection. And let's just run through this. You'll keep this for future reference. The Rebbe here lists some of the customs of how to celebrate a birthday. We're doing this. Why are we talking about birthdays? Because today is the birthday of Rebbe's in Gansburg, whose spirit never leaves. <laughs> The Rebbe said about the Rebbe Zahaya Mushka that her spirit also, no, the, of his mother, Rebbe Zahana, Rebbe Zahana, her spirit is always here. And Rebbe Zahansberg for many, many years was the presiding spirit over the girls in this dorm. So I presume, I think we could say safely that her spirit is also here. So that since her birthday, let's say we're talking about it, that it should be an aliyah for her neshama and from the Shama of everybody who was ever connected with this place. Because you know, when you're connected to a place, it's, it's through Torah and mitzvahs, it's eternal. It's not, a, it's not just something that passes. One, if you're a man, it's customary to be called to the Torah on the Shabbos before your birthday. If your birthday falls on Shabbos, you should have an aliyah on that day. What about you? What are you going to do? Make sure your husband has an aliyah. It's your birthday. And you should give extra tzedakah. He should give extra tzedakah on your birthday. Yeah. If your birthday falls on Shabbos, you give extra tzedakah on Friday and on Sunday. Rebbe never misses a chance to ask for more tzedakah. Because tzedakah, great is tzedakah, which hastens the Redemption, right? So birthdays are about redemption because all these customs are for us to hasten the birthday of the redemption. Put more time and effort into your prayer. Take part of your davening and say it slowly word by word. Those of you who've been in the class know how sometimes I talk about this. The Reb Zusha, who wrote the introduction to the, the approbation, if you know what that means. The introduction, it means the notice, it's like the stamp of approval. Approbation is like the word approval of the Tanya. He gave a stamp of approval to the Tanya. He used to daven word by word with Yiddish. So he would say a word in Hebrew in the prayer book and he would translate it into Yiddish. And he would say it out loud. It would take him a long time to dump, a long time. But his davening was fantastic. It was because every word was meaningful because he made sure he understood every word. Reb Zusha of Anipol, one of the great Talmudim of the Magda Mezerich, a friend and colleague of the Alter Rebbe. So he would say like this, Baruch, we'll use English, blessed, Ata are you, Adashem, Hashem, Elokeinu, our God, Melech, you are the king, Ha'olam, of the whole world. He'd be very excited. By the time he finished the brach, he was, you know, very excited. But he knew, he knew what he was saying. So that, that's a, a big job to, to do that for the whole davening. So take one, take one blessing of Shman, Shman Esra, or take one line of the Shema, Anybody know what that means? Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. He says, Shema, hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. What does that mean? It means Hashem is our God. Now, Hashem is one, he'll be our God after Moshiach comes to. He was, is, and always. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Okay, sign me up. And then if you know the Hebrew, then you say, but at least you thought about it in the language that you speak. You didn't just say the words. So that's how you intensify your davening. And the Rambam even recommends doing this and building up line by line. You have a lifetime. Hashem has a lot of time to wait for you to learn all the words. 
And he remembers which ones you remember, which ones you don't. And you forget, you can remember. So put more time and prayer into your prayers. And if possible, Tilim, say like we spoke of this already. And to study the, the chapter of Tilim for your new year. And to learn, we spoke about this also in the revealed part of the Torah and uh, like Sefer HaMitzvahs and in Hasidus, Asicha or something. And he also recommends, if it's possible, to learn something you could say, you could share with other people. Here it says, to learn a whole mimer by heart. Well, not if it was up to that. But I could learn a line, a paragraph, and I could read the rest, take a sicha, a short sicha. Uh, to reach out to friends and learn with them. Um, to share your smile with as many people as with 10 people. If you get 10, try 20. <laughs> it makes people happy. Somebody said to me the other day, why are you smiling all the time? I said, we have so much to be grateful for. And to isolate yourself, we spoke about that, and to review your life course, what can you be improve upon? Write it down so you don't forget. Try and write a few ideas. Someone asked me, Akron Shal Pesach, uh, an Israeli boy was sitting there in the, beside me. He said, did you sit here all the time, Akron Shal Pesach? I said, many years I sat here. He said, what did you see? He wanted to hear about, did the Rebbe jump up and wave his hands? Or what, what did he do? What was special? I said, I'll tell you what was special. At the end of the Fabrengan, the Rebbe took a siddur, and he opened the siddur, and he said the bracha chreina and the siddur. The Rebbe knows the whole Torah, Torah and Vim Ksuvim. He knows all the commentaries. He knows all the Mishnah. He knows all the Talmud by heart. All the Midrashim. He knows everything by heart. You could put a pin through the whole Talmud. The Rebbe will tell you every word that goes through. So for sure, he knew an Abrach Achrena by heart also. But when he came to say Abrach, he opened the Siddur. It won't take you a minute more out of your life. It's not in position in terms of time. It's just hard to discipline yourself to do it. Especially if you know the Bracha by heart. And the same thing I say, I could say applies to Asher Yatsar. When I came to Lubavitch, that was one of the first things they taught me. Learn Asher Yatsar by heart. <laughs> In those days, they didn't even have English sitters. <laughs> and I just certainly didn't have a sitter. So you have to learn Asher Yatsar. So wherever you go, you can always, if you're going you know, to stop at a, on a, on a trip, and you stop in at the pit stop, and you, you, you need the bathroom, you, the, 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 the men's room, the ladies' room, the washroom, you have to show Asher So if you can act. Nowadays, there's no excuse. You don't have to. It's all right here. So just uh, you know, sweep up till it's Hashem. There is here's the afterbrook right there. Got it. Okay. So these are decisions, and have a happy birthday party with your family and friends. There you go. That's our class. We've got four minutes left. Well. I'm not going to leave you just like that. Here, you have this page. Here's a page. Here's something you can learn and share on Shabbos. This is a great sicha about, about three dimensions of the Torah, where the Rebbe compares three different levels of Torah to the three blessings that the Jews had in the wilderness. They had the clouds of glory. They had the clouds of glory. Uh, which protected them, surrounded them, killed all the wild animals, snakes and scorpions. Protected them from the heat. Didn't have any rain. It made the rocky wilderness smooth and easy to travel. It laundered their clothes. Children grew up, their clothes grew with them. The air was fresh, mm, delicious. The clothes of clouds. The clouds 
were in the merit of Aaron. And they had water. The water was in the merit of Miriam. Because she drew Moshe. She, she, said, she watched over Moshe when he was in the water. And when, when Miriam passed away, the water disappeared. So from this we know that the Miriam was with them. For, the water was with them 40 years in the merit of Miriam. She died. Water passed, disappeared. And we're reading in this week's Parsha about how Moshe brought it back. When he struck the rock, instead of speaking to it by accident, it was a misunderstanding. He spoke to the wrong rock. A very, very strange midrashim going on here. And it's all re hardly referred to at all, not at all explicit in the Torah. Hard to understand. But the bottom line is that the water for 40 years, you know, it was, it was, it was like, it was like uh, the Mississippi River coming out of this rock, river, out of this rock. It divided into 12 rivers, which were boundaries between the 12 tribes. And to get from one tribe to the next, you had to take a boat. But there was a lot of water, a lot of water. And, so, and Moshe brought it back. When Aaron died, the clouds disappeared and Moshe brought it back. And then they had the food. The man was from Moshe. So when they all disappeared, Moshe brought them all back. And these are, Rebbe says, each of these refers to a level of Torah. And he explains what they were mean in Plimish Torah, in Hasidus. So that's a very interesting sikha. You could learn it at the table with your family where you eat or here if you eat with your, your friends. And since what happened on July 4th has caught everybody's attention, here is this extraordinary sikha extracted from a letter of, of the Rebbe which was written, I think, when, when, when the shooting of President Reagan, an attempted assassination. And the Reverend wrote us about juvenile delinquency. And, and he says, look at this paragraph here. It's an absolute second paragraph, juvenile delinquency. You got the page? To impress upon the minds of our young that the world in which we live is not a jungle. What is a jungle? We usually say life is a jungle. What do we mean? We mean that if we try to earn a living, you know, it's going to be a hard, it's going to be a hard fight. So there's a rabbit that finds it better. He says, in a jungle, brute force and cunning and passion with no control are, are the forces that rule. Young people have to know that that's not what the world is all about. The world has a master. He is not an abstraction. God is not an abstract concept. He is a personal God. That is to say, like a father. The Magda Mezrich gives a comparison. A he says, how is a, young, a child? The Baal Shem Tov was taught by his father, Rabbi Eliezer. When he was three years old, his father died. And he told him, his last things he told him was, don't be afraid of anybody or anything. Never be afraid. And love every Jew like, like your own self. And that became the, the basis of Hasidism. Love every Jew like yourself is like love of, love of God. And don't be afraid of anybody except Hashem is fear of God. So a child could say, how can I live like that? How can I not be afraid of anything? How? I am afraid. I'm afraid that people stay the danger. And people can be dangerous. So the Rebbe says, the Magda Mesrich answered this. He said, a father is much smarter than his children. He's educated. He knows so much more. Children will get all upset about things that the father doesn't get upset about. Children don't know about money or valuables. The father knows what they are. My, my granddaughter took her father's watch and flushed it down the toilet over Pesach. She, she had no concept of what it's all about. The father would be very upset because he understands. Child has no understanding. But the father does have understanding. So even though the father's understanding is, is so far superior to a child's understanding. How does he behave with a child? He loves the child. He gets down on his hands and knees and he crawls around the floor with the child and he speaks to the child 
in child's language. Big grown up people take a child in their hand, they say, and the child laughs and he giggles. The father's so happy. And the father plays with little toys with the child because he loves the child. So there's a mushroom. This is telling you, it's telling you, Hashem is like the father. He's, he's very wise. He's very smart. He's very great. But he doesn't mind to get down on his hands and needs to lower himself down to the level of a little child. The, and the father's going to protect the child and show his love to the child because Hashem is a loving father. It's not an abstract concept. It's a very deep idea. Hashem is a loving father, not an abstract concept. This has to be impressed on the mind of a child that he takes a personal interest in the child which is you and every individual and not only that but we are accountable to the child to the to the father if you flush your father's watch down the toilet you know it's he's not going to hit you He's going to scold you. Say, you must play with valuable things that belong to Tati and Mama. <laughs> he has to learn. Okay? And then he goes on. What are we going to do about child delinquent, juvenile delinquency, people behaving in such terrible ways? Shooting, you know, going up on the roof and just shooting people like that? The tragic symptom this is a tragic symptom of the disillusionment, insecurity, and confusion of the younger generation. It has not declined. On the contrary, it's increasing. This was written 60, 70 years ago. And police and law enforcing agencies are not succeeding in deterring it. And certainly they will not succeed in eliminate, eliminate, eliminating it unless at the root. The remedy lies in removing the cause, not merely the symptoms of juvenile delinquency. It's not enough to tell the juvenile delinquent that crime does not pay, he's going to, he or she is going to end up in jail, or that uh, unless, he's, unless he thinks he's so smart that he's going to outwit the, the police, he will not be impressed if he's admonished by saying you're breaking the law, it's an offense against society. You're undermining our safety. That we can live in a safe society. We're here on President Street, it's pretty safe. You don't have to worry. When I came to live here, there were a lot of streets in Crown Heights you couldn't walk on them without getting mugged. Now it's changed. It's a, a more affluent area. Nobody can even afford a house here anymore. But what's important to engrave upon the child's mind is none of these ideas. The child has to know that the wrongdoing is not against society and it's a, 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 an offense against divine authority. And our attitude towards divine authority, what, what is divine authority? It's spelled out for us in the Torah. And in the Shulchan Or, Code of Shulchan Or, Code of Jewish Law, tells us how we're expected to behave. And if you think, I don't like that kind of behavior, I don't want to wear long sleeves, I don't want to wear stockings in this hot weather. Well, if it's not, if it, the Shulchan Or doesn't permit it, this is not an offense against society or against Hasidic customs, it's an offense against God. And there are repercussions. We're accountable for what we do. And one bad thing leads to another bad thing. And this has to be impressed on the mind of a child. And we have to be, children have to be trained from their earliest years. And it's easy now to do that, to do this, that there's an eye that sees everything. There's, so there are cameras and there are tape recorders. And every, everything you say is written down. And not only everything you say, but we learned in our Hasidus class this year, everything that you think. 
because it's not just things that you do, there's things that you think about doing. Just like the things that you do are recorded, the things that you think about doing are also recorded. So don't think, well, nobody's looking. There's an eye that sees, there's an ear that hears. Somebody gets on your nerves and you don't say anything. It's good that you don't say anything. There used to be a, I used to go to a, a quick copy printer. The lady there had a sign on the desk, speak when you're angry, you'll make the best speech you ever live to regret. You'll be sorry. You'll get it off your chest, but you'll be very sorry afterwards. And you can't take, once you say a thing, you can't take it back. So when you hold yourself in, that's good. But the words that you wanted to say, they're recorded. But the fact that you didn't say them is their big accomplishment. And the words that you don't say actually become jewels and a crown for Hashem. Because you didn't say them. And when you don't say bad things, Hashem is, has great, great pleasure from it. But still, you still have to do tshuva that you wanted to say bad things. The Rebbe didn't say bad things. So we shouldn't say bad things. But it's all recorded. A person has to know there's an eye that sees. So you catch a glance at something you're not, uh, oh, that's not appropriate. So you look away. If you're strong-minded enough to look away. But if the, this handsome person who's not wearing enough clothes caught your uh, attention and you look a second time, uh-oh, that's your doing. That's something you did. First time wasn't your fault. Second time, you're, is you're accountable. And it's recorded. It's there. How do you get it? How do you get rid of it? How do you erase the tape? How do you erase the video? That's called Julie. Chuva can erase the video. And if Chuva gives you the strength not to do it again, then the, then the mistake that you made becomes motivation for the next mitzvah, the next time you don't do it, the mitzvah that you do. So you transform the negative into a positive. We cannot leave it to law enforcement agencies to be the keepers of our morality. The solution relies only in bringing our, to our youth an awareness of the supreme authority who is not only to be feared, but also like a child loves his father to be loved. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next week at this time. Hope you enjoyed the class. Appreciate you very much. This is your comment. If you're at a date, screening the children from their early years to have your fear and love.